Hello, welcome to The Intersect, where academia, industry, and the DoD meet. My name is Matthew Bakovic. I'm joined today by my colleague, Alan Cohn. Welcome, Alan. Thanks for having me. Well, hey, thanks for being here. Uh, today, we're going to talk about uh, embedded software engineering uh, and roles in that discipline. So uh, the first question I think our audience might have is, when we say embedded software engineering or embedded software engineers, um, what does that mean? What does that look like? Yeah, so when people generally think of software engineers, they might conjure up an image of a web-based application, uh, like you know maybe the website they use for their banking, or, hey, I made this really cool app on my phone. That's not what embedded software engineering is. Embedded software engineering is looking at um, individual single standalone products and, look, and looking at the software that goes into those products. So think like a Roku uh, mm -hmm. device, right? That's embedded software engineering. The firmware that's on your phone is an is a form of embedded software engineering. So it sounds like then it's it's specialized. Would you say that it's it's um, then more complicated than than standard software engineering? So I wouldn't say more complicated because I'm never done. I've never really done web development, so I can't I can't really say it's more complicated. It just has a whole nother host of issues, right? In an embedded platform, you have to worry about things like memory management um, that you might not necessarily have to worry about uh, if you're doing a web-based application. Uh, you're taught you have to worry about more resiliency, right? When your web app goes down, you can just restart the server, right? That's not always an option when you're talking about embedded platforms. So you have to have that robustness built into it. So you mentioned uh, devices like Roku or or mobile phones. Um, being a, a, an FFRDC sponsored by the Department of Defense, can you maybe explain at a high level the sorts of devices we support for the DoD that are that have Im embedded software engineering considerations? Sure, you can imagine almost just about every single platform that the DoD fields that has any type of computer chip in it has some form of embedded software engineering. Every plane, every boat, uh, every weapon, like cruise missile has some form of brains in it. And that brain, those brains are the embedded software logic that tells it what to do and how to do it. You, you know, if you look at massive platforms, you think big planes like F-35, mm -hmm. you think one of these aircraft carriers, there is so much embedded software. Every single system has some form of software in it that these massive systems of systems are just incredibly complex and complicated intertwining of capability and functionality. I think of the Mark Andreessen famous quote about, you know, software is eating the world, right? That there is now software in places we never imagined uh, at a scale that we couldn't envision. Absolutely. And even, even, you know, we had a, it was like last year, right? When Delta, when the, I think it was CrowdStrike, Delta had that problem, the whole Delta infrastructure went down and it took them a week to get back online. That was a software mm -hmm. problem that, and I know we're going to talk about a little later, safety, yeah. right? That just comes back to, you know, we don't really think about it whenever you go and get on a plane, you're like, oh, I'm, you know, scan your boarding pass and you get on the plane, but there's so much infrastructure sure. behind it. Sure. So one of the things, Alan, I, I like to explore with our guests is their path to the SCI. So, um, I was hoping you could tell us about your experiences, your background, maybe your education that brought you to this role at the SCI. Sure, absolutely. So I was I grew up in Westchester, Pennsylvania, which is just west of Philadelphia. Um, when I graduated high school, I went to uh, college at the University of Maryland, uh, where I was I majored in computer engineering. One of the internships that I did while I was up there was closer to home in Camden, New Jersey, at an L3 Harris facility. I had a lot of fun during that internship, so that's where I went to go work full time. The primary thing that I did there, I worked on their cyber team, mm -hmm. uh, and they focused on building uh, NSA certified Type One crypto crypto boxes. Mm -hmm. So again, imagine these just singular boxes, embedded software. It had to be incredibly safe and secure since these protected the infrastructure of our entire DOD and intelligence community. Um, I worked there for about five years, and then my wife, who is from Pittsburgh, uh, decided she wanted to be closer to home and plant roots here. So I started looking for DOD jobs. I enjoyed working in the defense industry, and the Software Engineering Institute popped up, and I jumped on the opportunity to apply. Great. Thanks. So it sounds like you you specialized where you started in a, a, a sort of traditional computer science education and, and set of experiences, and then specialized in an embedded systems and investment systems engineering. Um, I really like what you said about working with or for the DOD. One of the things that makes uh, our job special is being part of this national defense mission. Um, and you mentioned safety. It seems to me that the, the kind of things that you're describing 
you know, safety is of paramount importance, right? That the, 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 the software engineering that you do has dramatic physical consequences potentially. Absolutely. So most of the platforms that we work on and that they bring us in for are either mission critical or safety critical systems. Things that are actually are either protecting the warfighter or things that must always go right to make sure that either people or equipment is not unduly harmed unnecessarily. Right. So it, it's um, there's a special focus then on, on the outcome, right? The go fast, break stuff, fail early isn't great sometimes when you're designing things like cruise missiles, right? So um, I think it's a really special aspect of it. Um, so from, from that vantage point, when, when we know there is profound physical consequences for these systems, how does that change uh, the engineering part of software engineering? Are there additional steps you take or additional processes or safeguards? How, how do you evaluate the robustness, the trustworthiness, and, and the safety of these systems. Absolutely. So, you know, move fast and break things is great when you're building an application. Yeah. It's not great when you're building a weapon system that has the potential to do real destruction on the opposite side of it, right? So one of the things that everyone, that we really make sure that all of our DoD customers are considering upfront is building the safety and security into the system ahead of time. It's very challenging to go and build an entire system that's functional and then after the fact sprinkle in a little bit of safety on top because it's it's really hard for you to really make it safe and secure you can do it it's just significantly more challenging and awfully and often more costlier so the focus really is when we work with our DoD customers is to try to get them to think about safety requirements and security requirements what are the ways that this thing can go wrong and when it starts going wrong how do you make sure that it fails in a way that isn't going to endanger personnel or people so it's really about that upfront consideration more than anything else. Yeah, thanks. It seems to me that the, the nature of these devices makes fixes and updates more difficult. I, I, we, we were speaking before the broadcast about you know things like um, spacecraft, right? And other types of devices where it, it's not easy to do an over-the-air update. You certainly can't go out and touch it and imply a USB to, to do a fix. So thoughts about um, the way that that requirement for sort of touch once and then deploy uh, influences the the discipline of, of embedded engineering. Yeah, and it all comes back to safety and security and thinking about how do I build this stuff fit? You know, when, like I said, when your server goes down, you can just walk over to your server rack, plug it, unplug it, flick a switch, and all of a sudden it's better. But if you're if you're flying somewhere, right, in a, in a jet or you're deployed out in the middle of the ocean and something goes wrong, you have to be able to have enough resiliency and robustness built into your platforms to be able to circumvent and recover from that, right? We don't want to lose, the warfighter doesn't want to lose capability just because there was a software bug or we didn't consider the safety aspect, right? It's really about the recovery of those things and being able to auto recover as much as possible in the field. That is really the primary focus of a lot of our safety investigations. Yeah, thanks. I, 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 I... I'm thinking about folks that are watching this or maybe either in the profession or thinking about the profession, um, maybe just get technical for a minute. What sort of programming languages do your engineers interact with? Yeah, so when we talk about embedded software, the most common languages that we see are C and C++. Most of our government customers are using uh, C and C++ as their primary languages. We see a lot of uh, customer work that is using ADA mm -hmm. as a programming language. I know that's not about brought up very often, but it is still a very mm -hmm. common DoD software, especially on legacy systems. Um, we don't really use like something like a Java that much because that's more of a web-based thing. Our, pr our primary languages that we focus on are C and C++. And then when we get to the test side of things, when we talk about test frameworks, that's when you start to get into scripting languages like Python. Uh, we start to see a lot of tools written in Python or Python-based plugins. So you know, we, we really do kind of see the gamut rust is a brand new mm -hmm. a brand new language i say brand new it's a couple years old. now right but it, it's still coming into the fold of is rust a c or c plus plus replacement sure. and we're starting to see more and more people consider maybe replacing c and c plus plus with rust but we're nowhere near that so the, the debate over memory safe languages essentially is oh, that the... absolutely i mean that's one of the driving forces for rust and I will say, right, as someone who has been a C and C++ developer my entire career, these languages have gotten a lot more safe than they were 10 years or 20 years ago. C++11 and beyond has made a lot of great strides in making the language safer. You know, 
but again it all you know it's a double-edged sword right yes they make the language safer but it also comes down to the users mm -hmm. right and that's where we come in as as a lot of the work that we do here um and on my team is to make sure that the developers are using the language properly in safe and effective manners to make sure sure that they're not doing something they're not supposed to do because the language can only do so much. Yeah, right? and that's really part of our mission is building capacity and capability within our mission partners to do those things on their own and, and, and advancing the state of the practice. Yep, absolutely. Which is a wonderful element of what we do here. So um, for folks that are watching that are interested, we're looking for embedded software engineers here at the SCI, isn't that right? Uh, we're looking for a lot of so embedded software engineers. Okay. Yeah. Uh, can you maybe describe at a high level, and, and there's sensitivities to, to the, the specifics, but the, the sorts of, of programs and projects they might work on if they join us? Sure. Uh, we ha we work on all different types of platforms. We work on weapon systems. We work on planes and boats. Uh, we work on, um, we even have some space stuff. We, we don't just work with DOD. We work with other organizations mm -hmm. like NASA to do space-based stuff. Um, really, our, the underpinning of all of this is, is the embedded software. Where, right, and it's mission and safety critical. Uh, we are looking for a lot of different, we are looking for like five or six, higher specifically for the team that I'm leading. Um, but we, I know my whole greater team outside of just the team that I'm leading are looking for individuals as well. No, great, Alan. So if, if you're interested and you're watching today, please do visit the SEI website and look at our, our open positions yep. uh, section. So a question, uh, these engineers that we're looking to, to, to bring on board, they won't just be located in Pittsburgh, correct? There's opportunities to work in other geographies? Correct. So my team that I'm currently leading is looking for Pittsburgh-based engineers, but my greater team, right, the directorate that I work in, it's called Enab Enabling Mission Capabilities at Scale. My directorate does a lot of other programs besides just mine, and they are looking for remote uh, embedded, we call them, excuse overloading the term embedded, right, embedded embedded engineers to actually go and work at customer sites. We're looking for people in Florida. We're looking for people in Alabama. We're looking for people in Utah who can be embedded with the current programs we have on contracts, offices to go work with the government personnel and represent the SEI and help the government meet their goals, but do so not physically located here in Pittsburgh, but do so on site on a daily basis. Yeah, I like the description of we're embedding embedded engineers for embedded yes. systems. Okay, yes. understood. That's what we do, yeah. Okay, excellent. So let's talk about the the sort of folks that might be a, 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 the best fit for this sort of work. You mentioned uh, your background in traditional computer science, and then you pivoted after having some experiences with, with um, embedded systems. Are there specific skill sets or experiences that we're looking for uh, as, as we seek these resources? Yeah, so uh, for my team specifically, right, we are a deeply technical team. So most of the work that we are doing is in is in, is in software every day, right? The 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 positions we just mentioned off-site, those are more of a technical consultation, right? Help the program office understand the software they're getting, understand uh, the implications, the software development lifecycle, the considerations, all that stuff. My team specifically is a very technically deep team. We are looking at software every day on all these different platforms, uh, analyzing it, making sure it's meeting requirements. So the people we're looking for are people who have a lot of experience in software, not just talking about software or reading software, but actually writing software. We're looking for people who know how to how to analyze software for mission critical and safety critical features, who understand the implications of what that means to add in the robustness and resiliency that we were talking about earlier. Um, and one of the things we're looking for too is if there are engineers out there who have that, have that experience and also have worked in the DOD and are familiar with DOD, the DOD life cycle, or are just familiar with the software development life cycle as a whole, right? How how you derive a requirement or how you write a requirement and then you derive that into a design mm -hmm. and then you implement that and then you test it and understand how all those pieces fit together and what the proper process is. Those are really the people that, we're, that we'd love to bring on to this team uh, because we have a lot of work to do and we're really looking to, to grow our the, the overall team's technical capabilities. So through an expansion mode, which is great to yes. hear. Um, well, if, if folks are interested in generally about the work that we do in embedded systems engineering, I know there's resources on our website. There's there's yeah. white papers and blogs, and I would encourage anyone that's interested to have a look at those things. So, Alan, a question for you. Sure. Um, and I often ask this of, of our guests: uh, what what is the 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 thing you point to as the reason you work here at the SEI? So the biggest thing for me, and I think we've said it a, yeah. a couple times already, is impact. 
you know, one of the internships that I did when I was in college was I worked as an application, an intern application developer at a, an insurance company, right? Working on those web-based stats. And while I did a lot of cool, cool work and I learned a lot, I didn't really feel as fulfilled when I left that job and I went back to school and then I, I tried the defense and that turned out to be, I felt like I was having an almost immediate impact. Right. There's something to be said when you build a, a box, right, that's mm -hmm. going to go into the field and, you know, is critical is critical infrastructure to protect the warfighter in this country, sensitive information and know that your software is running every single day out there in the field. That's an impact that I enjoyed having. And when this opportunity arose and I found out of all the different programs and things that this the institute was involved in, especially this current team that I'm on. I jumped at the opportunity because I am having, I feel like I am having a massive impact today. This team that I'm currently working on is a high, is highly visible in the, within the, the, within the Air Force that we're current, which is our, our current government customer within the Air Force, we're a highly visible activity. And I know that the end result is going to have a massive impact on the field building of these platforms once they're out there. Yeah, I think that is, I mean, I, I would offer a very similar answer, which is, um, being part of a mission that's so important and having the, the ability to see a direct impact is so, so important. Um, I do have to ask another question. Sure. So uh, given that you're now embedded in Pittsburgh and no longer in the Philadelphia area, have you had to change your football allegiance? I have not. Okay. Uh, I have not. Uh, you know, the a lot of things changed when I came out here to Pittsburgh, a lot of different things, but one thing that didn't change was my football allegiance. Excellent. I, I there, There's something noble in that. So, yes. so Alan, I want to thank you for the discussion today. If folks are interested, please do visit the SEI Careers website. Um, and certainly, Ellen, I hope you come back to do a future webcast. Sure, no, this was a lot of fun. Thanks, thanks again. You. Take care. Yeah, thanks.